So depression is never appropriate. Depression is a psychiatric diagnosis that's completely separate from a medical diagnosis. Unfortunately, specialists tend to focus on their organ of interest. When you see the liver doctors, they're very concerned about what your liver's doing. They may not think to ask you how your mood is. Um, quite honestly, although I have to say that the teams I work with are absolutely outstanding and do a great job of referring people to me, but doctors are afraid of, of offending patients by recommending they see a psychiatrist. Because as Tina mentioned, a lot of patients are like, well, I'm not crazy. And just because the doctor suggests you see a psychiatrist doesn't mean you're crazy. Could be that you're seeing a really smart psychiatrist that really knows what they're talking about and can make them better, like me. Yay! Um, so doctors are afraid, or patients are afraid of doctors seeing them as needy. Um, patients are afraid that psychiatric treatment will result in medical issues being dismissed. I think for um, a lot of doctors without a lot of insight, they can kind of think less of a patient's medical issues, but it just shouldn't be the case. Um, fear of expensive psychiatric treatment. There are psychiatric treatments that are actually quite expensive. However, there's also legislation being passed for mental health parity, meaning medical insurance plans have to cover psychiatric diagnoses on par with a medical diagnosis. So that last factor should actually be improving. All right, so let's talk quickly about medical disorders associated with depression. Um, I'll let you guys read over this later on, but um, just to sort of highlight a couple of points, hypothyroidism, which is actually a very common problem in PBC patients, is associated with depression, as are autoimmune diseases, like PBC, but other uh, autoimmune disorders, such as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, those are also associated with uh, depression. Um, there are medications that are associated with depression, particularly steroids, some cardiac drugs, uh, let's hit some high points, anxiety medications, uh, benzodiazepines are things like um, Ativan, Clonopin, Xanax, Valium, those are associated with depression. Pain medicines, um, which have been in the media a lot lately, are also associated with depression. Um, depression is one of the most common complications of all chronic illnesses. One third of people with serious medical illnesses experience symptoms of depression. As I said, they are not a normal part of the illness and they're highly treatable. Um, treating depression can actually uh, improve quality of life, um, certainly improve compliance and improve survival. And this factor, improving survival, has actually specifically been shown to be the case in liver disease. So here's just a cool quote. I can't change the wind, but I can adjust my sails. Um, the source of this is unknown. It's not that I don't know the answer. It's that nobody does. Um, just to make you guys think I'm smart. All right. Um, sources of depression and chronic illness, you guys know all about this. So pain, disruption, stress on relationship, patient and doctor conflicts, which I want to spend more time talking about because um, as the bus driver here, I think that's an important part of what I do. Um, chronic illnesses are associated with a loss of control, uncertainty about the future, certainly a lot of financial stress, fatigue, and medication side effects. Um, I'll let you guys look at this later. All right, so how do you know when you need pro oops, professional help for depression? Um, if you're functioning, meaning your ability to go to work, your abil ability to do what you want to do, your ability to interact with your family, take care of your kids, is limited because you are depressed, that's a sign it ought to be treated. Um, if your symptoms are causing you difficulty in sleeping, um, changes in your appetite, that's a sign it should be treated. Particularly if your depression interferes with compliance with medical treatment. You know, particularly for a post-transplant patient, this can be really imminently life-threatening. Um, but say you're, you're very depressed and you're thinking, oh, 
you know, what's the point in taking all these pills? I'm, you know, I can't really tell that they're making a difference anyway. That's a sign you really need urgent treatment for your depression because as we, we've seen this morning, you know, we've got treatments that work. And so if you're not able to take them because you're so hopeless, we really need to get you back on board. If you're attempting to self-medicate through the use of drugs or alcohol, um, particularly when you already have a liver disease, that's really an urgent situation. And if you're having not just suicidal thoughts, like maybe the situation's hopeless, but more you're thinking about ways you could kill yourself, you're thinking about when you would do it and where would be the best place, okay, that's really an emergency and you need to get to it, the ER and get some help today. Um, treatments for medication include talk therapy and medications. I'll talk a little bit about some of the treatments I like for depression that are things that you can do yourself. Reading, journaling, workbooks, such as a workbook called Mind Over Mood, it's excellent. Um, writing, volunteering, exercise, pets, surfing the net. Um, Dr. Beerling, tune in here. Um, happiness is a warm beagle. Beagles make both of us very happy. Uh, and so here's my psychotherapy right there. That's around Christmas time. Um, all right, other medications that we use for depression include stimulants. Again, what we talked about for fatigue, new vigil or provigil. Again, we talked about that for fatigue. Um, Medications for depression are safe, although not all antidepressants are safe in the context of liver disease. So that's where it really helps to have an expert managing it. Um, you need to take into account how your medications play well with others or not so well. Identify your target symptoms. If fatigue's a, a target symptom, then you want to think about using something more like Wellbutrin. If you have trouble sleeping or you're having trouble with your appetite being low, then one of the things that might be helpful is something like Remeron. Um, and that's what I mean by side effects or fringe benefits. We can use side effects to our advantage. Um, the other thing too is there have been studies about how Zoloft or sertraline helps itching. So if itching is really a big deal, it might be that you'd want to go with an antidepressant like Zoloft to treat both your itching and your depression. If you're very late in your disease and you have what's called decompensated cirrhosis, which I believe Victory and Comisay talked about yesterday, treating hepatic encephalopathy with something like um, Zyfaxin uh, can be very helpful because depressive symptoms, not a depressive disorder, but very episodic fleeting symptoms of depression are overlooked as one of the symptoms of hepatic encephalopathy. And this can make a huge difference very late in the disease. Um, it's important to find a purpose, living because of instead of living in spite of. Continue working to the extent possible, even if you have to make modifications at work meaning reduced work hours. Um, if work is impossible, volunteer. I really feel very strongly that it's important to stay involved and get out of the house doing something every single day. Um, there's, a, you know, there's real utility in the saying, use it or lose it. Let's talk quickly about anxiety because I really want to talk about doctors and patients. Um, Anxiety means feeling stressed, uptight, tense, irritable, worrying excessively. Some of us ruminate and hash things over in our heads over and over and over. Um, nervousness, having panic attacks, those are all symptoms of anxiety. All right, some of the medical causes of anxiety that are relevant to PBC include hepatic encephalopathy, late in the uh, disease, thyroid problems, um, medications that may be used for autoimmune diseases or medications used after transplant, steroids, immunosuppressants, those are actually very common causes of anxiety. So your anxiety may have a medical or medication-related explanation. So it's really important that you learn about your illness, particularly because it's so rare. You're going to know more about your illness than your physician is. But make sure you're learning about it from reputable, reputable websites, such as 
NIH and the AASLD website. Make sure you're not just going off a little single patient reports on the internet because if you look long enough, you'll find a report that pretty much tells you anything you want to see or don't want to see. Um, knowledge will help you to communicate more effectively with your treatment team. Helps you feel a sense of control despite the chaos of a chronic illness. Um, medication treatments of anxiety include antidepressants, uh, benzodiazepines, but they have a very high risk of addiction, abuse, dependence, withdrawal. Um, and then in elderly patients, they're really um, advised against. For elderly people, there's a list of medicines on what's called the beers list, as in the drink beer. Um, and it, they are clearly on the beers list and are, very, and are cautioned against in the elderly. Boost bar and beta blockers that are used for portal hypertension can actually be used to our advantage in the treatment of anxiety. Um, other strategies for managing anxiety include limiting caffeine, exercising regularly, um, learning relaxation strategies. Um, what I encourage people to do who worry a lot is to make a strategy, a list of strategies on an index card of things that help their anxiety, carry that around with them, and then if they're feeling particularly anxious, pull that index card out to see what helps. Avoid watching the news. The news can make us all anxious. Um, maintain a list of things that, to worry about. Um, set aside time each day to worry. Say, okay, I get to worry every day from 7 to 8 p.m. Start a kitchen timer. Don't do anything else during that time. That's your time to worry, make lists, you know, worry about things, catastrophize, whatever. Come 8 o'clock, okay, you're done. Tomorrow, 7 o'clock, you got your worry time. Um, excellent website called anxieties.com. I'll let you guys check it out. All right, so one of my favorite topics is helping people work more effectively with their doctors. Um, I often hear, PBC and the treatments aren't the biggest stressor. It's dealing with Dr. Fill in the blank. All right, so how do you work more effectively with your doctor, especially since you may be more worried about things like fatigue and itching, itching and your doctor may be more concerned about what did your imaging show, what's your alkphos, what's your bilirubin, you know, how's your chemistry panel looking? Well, maybe we need to do an EGD, and so it's really common for you guys to not intersect and you guys to just kind of talk over each other and next thing you know, you're disappointed with the visit. Okay, so what I like to encourage people to do is absolutely positively prepare an updated medication list. Every single person in this room, regardless of what your medical problem is, even if it's not PBC, should have an updated medication list on them at all times. You never know when you're gonna go see the grandkids when you're gonna end up in an ER and not be able to remember things, and you ought to just carry an updated medication list with you. What I recommend to transplant patients is keep them in the glove compartment of every single car you own because girls change purses frequently, but the thing that you're likely to get to a place with is one of your cars. So keep it in a car. All right, so what I like to encourage people to do is prepare a one-page summary because quite frankly, your doctor will be freaked out if you have 10 typed written pages of stuff and the doctor comes in the room and sees you shuffling through these pages, the doctor's gonna be like, oh my God. And so includes uh, prepare a one page summary, a summary of your current symptoms, um, your recent visits to other doctors and prepare a short list of questions, okay? Your top three most important questions. Okay, so what is, and your goals for the appointment, but probably your goals and your questions overlap. overlap. So I did an experiment with some of my patients a few years ago. There was a doctor who consistently rounded very quickly. And patients and families were very um, disappointed because the doctor would not stay in the patient's room long enough to answer questions. And I told every single one of them, he had like maybe 10 patients on the floor at, at that time. 
I went around to every single room, and I said, we're going to do an unofficial study, but I want to try an experiment. I want you to write three of your questions on a single sheet of paper. Don't have any other sheets of paper with it. And then when the doctor attempts to try to leave the room or is clearly finishing up, say, doctor, I have three, and say it exactly like this. I have three questions for you today. Number one, and I said, just keep talking. So he can't say no, and he's going to be very rude if he leaves the, the room in the middle of your questions. And say, number one, blah, blah, blah. Let him answer the question. Number two. So that does a couple of things. As a doctor, you're able to see your, you know, we all want to help our patients, but we're also all under significant time constraints to cover a lot of ground and still get home and be able to eat and sleep at some point. But what three questions does is it helps us see an end point. It also helps us understand your need. And so I went back around and I asked all these patients and families, I said, okay, so tell me about the experiment. They unanimously said, oh my gosh, that worked so great. So do the same thing in your doctor's office. Um, another important thing is to identify the appropriate uh, doctor for your issue. Um, so if you have a concern about a foot issue, um, it's totally unrelated to your liver disease, don't, don't dump it on your hepatologist thinking that they're going to know what to do. Give that to your orthopedist or your primary care doctor. Um, again, identify your goals for the appointment ahead of time. During the appointment, if know what refills you need and know what pharmacy you want them sent to and have the pharmacy number and request refills and get any letters you need during the appointment because it can be a huge pain if you're going to a big medical center and you forgot to ask a letter for a letter it may take days or weeks to get that done whereas the nurse might have some template for a letter right then and be able to get it done for you these are just some books that i like on chronic illness i would say out of both pages of books i like the one at the bottom is probably one of my favorites, The Lonely Patient, How We Experience Illness. It's actually very well written. Um, some of these others about, are about autoimmune illness. Um, they're also good. Um, these are also good. All right, so how do you find psychiatric help if you decide you need it? Um, first of all, if you live around here, have a liver disease, I'll see you. Um, so. Probably the most efficient way is to look at your insurance provider panel and then actually call the office and see if what you're seeing on the internet or in your insurance book is actually the case. Um, because particularly with Medicare plans, it may not really be how it is. Um, if you're employed, there's employee assistance program. Um, they provide typically four to six sessions of counseling, may have some uh, mechanisms for referrals for um, medication management. Um, the American Psychiatric Association can give you some other ideas. Um, a great way to do it if you have a long-term relationship with a doctor is to ask any of your doctors, hey, who do you like? because a lot of times um, your doctor may know um, people that they really like. Um, all right, so support groups for depression and bipolar disorder, um, not just bipolar disorder, but also for depression. DBSA, um, the DBSA uh, website for Houston is either dbsahouston.org or .com. Um, these are other ways to find free support groups for patients with depression. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions or answers. Oh, can I just mention one other thing? I heard you guys are going to um, talk about um, dry mouth. Um, one of the things I commonly prescribe to patients, particularly with PBC, is there is a medicine called pilocarpine, uh, P-I-L-O-C-A-R-P-I-N-E, and it makes you salivate more. 
Um, can also make you sweat a little bit more. Um, but a lot of people with really dry mouth um, actually don't care. They just don't want to have a dry mouth. I have not had patients report any good results with the um, biotin mouthwashes or rinses. One thing that can help if you're um, uh, not diabetic is also um, eating very sour candy. Um, there's a candy called Warheads. Um, that can help as well. I think stress makes everything worse. Um, yeah, and I think also, you know, I think both it can make symptoms worse, but I think it can alter our perception. You know, if I'm super stressed, then then life seems worse. If you start a depression medication, is it normally Uh Not necessarily. So um, what I would say is you don't want to abruptly discontinue antidepressants, particularly like Effexor. I have seen people show up in the, the ER literally having stroke-like symptoms. They can't walk. They're falling down. They've got a bad headache. And it's because they abruptly stopped their Effexor, even if they just requested a refill too late. Um, some antidepressants are, are more forgiving of stopping than others, but the current recommendation, and this can be kind of hard for patients to figure out, but the current uh, treatment guidelines are if you have had three or more episodes of depression over your lifetime, then you probably really ought to be on probably lifelong treatment. But just because you're depressed today and having a depressive episode doesn't mean you've bought yourself treatment for the rest of your life. Just please work, work with your doctor about how do you taper and discontinue an antidepressant. And these two questions are very similar. One is, what's the best way to treat Okay, so the avoiding stimulants is uh, for um, uh, insomnia. Okay, so if you have a lot of, and stimulants in that context, I was referring to caffeine. Um, so caffeine in uh, my love, Diet Mountain Dew, um, or in caffeine uh, in coffee. Um, I meant avoid stimulants in that sense. I didn't mean avoid stimulants as in medications sense. So the really nice thing about um, the amphetamines such as uh, Ritalin and Vyvanse or medications like ProVigil or NuVigil. So you can take those once every blue moon if your fatigue is really that intermittent, which I've often started people out you know, they've often thought, oh, I don't want to take this every day. And I'll think, oh, okay, I bet you will after you try it. But, um, you know, if you want to just take it intermittently, all of those are completely fine to take as infrequently or as frequently as you want. And what I would say for the middle of the day fatigue is probably what I would do is plain Ritalin. Or the other name for it is methylphenidate, uh, M-E-T-H-Y-L-P-H-E-N-I-D-A-T-E. -E. Super cheap. Going to be less than $10 a month. Because even somebody with very advanced disease, say I have somebody high up on the transplant list, um, very high MELD score, um, who has fatigue, say it's worse like, uh, 12 to 2 ish. Really, you can take methylphenidate or Ritalin um, in the immediate release form and still be able to fall asleep at night. So, even in very advanced liver disease, your body's going to be done with it in six hours. So, what I say is just count backwards from the time you want to go to bed by six hours and don't take it any later than that. All of these are very uh, forgiving of um, intermittent use. And our last question is, do you refer to or work with marriage and family therapists or impact on individual couple and family relationships? 
So the answer is yes, but what I would say is you have to understand what's going on in your marriage. If your marriage is very troubled and has been for a long time for issues apart from your illness, if you can say, yeah, the illness is a part of it, but yeah, this has been a mess for a long time, we've thought about separating, divorcing, whatever, I would say, okay, see a marital therapist. But what I can say is that a lot of times for a healthy marriage, and you guys know what that means, um, for a healthy marriage that is maybe just um, being briefly stressed by a change in an illness, is stressed by a new diagnosis, I would say education is the key. And so what I'll tell people is, you know what? Bring your husband in. I want to meet with the two of you. I do not meet with the other. I don't meet with the spouse alone just for confidentiality issues. I also think it just is also a recipe for disaster. But um, have your spouse come in, and we'll spend an hour or an hour and a half, and I will teach about the disease. All the things Dr. Veerling and others have covered. What is this disease? What are the medications that treat it? How does the disease usually behave? Here's how you guys can look at your lab work and tell what your disease is doing. Um, here's how the disease in terms of fatigue and itching, and here's why she wants the room so cold, and you know, later on in the disease, here's why she's so moody and confused, and here's all the medication side effects. Spending an hour and a half teaching in a healthy marriage often solves the problem because the guy will often say oh well wow I didn't know all of that okay I you know I can live with that but you know I just thought she was avoiding everything I didn't know that she's actually tired and it's because her disease causes that so a one-time meeting together might solve the issue a, a sick marriage yes, probably refer needs to be referred for marital therapy. Does that make sense? Perfect, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Before we let, let Dr. Pate go, as is, is I have told you, she is my bus driver. You all have had the opportunity to hear from my two primary physicians that manage my disease. If anybody has any specific questions about how they have helped me, or how they have treated me, catch me anytime. I am happy to share because what has worked for me may end up being something you can take back to your own physicians, but I have the benefit of having them here helping us. Um, Thank you. That's very nice. And oh, this is cool. a small token of our appreciation. We thank you. At this point in time, thank you. very fun for me. Who remembers our dance from yesterday? Second floor. Right, right, left. It's lunchtime, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you back here for those that want to participate in the ALF Lemon at 110, otherwise 115. Thank you.